this is Adam Chai of Blomedia. Today, we are going to share some insight about the blockchain, crypto, and the Bitcoin with the Samsung Mo. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on your show. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Recently, I heard that you are working on the Gen3, which mm -hmm. is related to the Bitcoin payment project. Uh, tell me something about the Gen3. What is it and something other interesting things about the Gen3? So Gen3 is a new company I started. I describe it as a Bitcoin technology company. So we are focused on Bitcoin and uh, layers that extend Bitcoin like Lightning and the Liquid Network. So that is a Bitcoin sidechain. Our goal is to get Bitcoin and other assets into the hands of people around the world. Uh, primarily, the, the target market would be Latin America or developing countries where they could use Bitcoin or they need Bitcoin. The focus is really just onboarding more people into the Bitcoin network. Uh, it is said that you are one of the Bitcoin maximalists. What makes you as the Bitcoin maximalist and what do you think is the benefit and the strength of the Bitcoin? Well, a Bitcoin maximalist is a term used to describe Bitcoiners. But there is no clear definition of what it means. I like to say I'm a common sense maximalist. So I'm a firm believer in Bitcoin and I'm only invested in Bitcoin because I believe Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency that matters and is actually decentralized. And it has the potential to become a base layer for a new financial system. So all of the other projects, all of the shit coins and tokens, those are really just a distraction from the more important mission, which is bringing Bitcoin to the world. Sure. So I, I don't always say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. People will call me that, but uh, sure. Uh, so you think the only coin that matters is the Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and other coins are have some kind of centralized things. So yeah. that makes the coins shit coin, right? Yes. So, or they're misleading people with their marketing. So, uh, at, at the end of the day, all of these things are just uh, blockchains and it's technology, it's software. The challenge is how you market that software. If you tell people this thing is decentralized, this thing is better than Bitcoin, this thing enables a decentralized finance or DeFi, then it's sort of a lie. Because that is not decentralized. Yeah. So, we like to call them Dino. D-I-N-O, decentralized in name only. So they say they're decentralized, but they're not really decentralized. And a good example is Ethereum. Ethereum largely is run on Infura. Infura is run on Amazon. So when there is an Amazon outage, usually all the exchanges stop accepting Ethereum deposits because they can't query Infura, which is on Amazon. If your entire blockchain depends on Amazon, it's not really decentralized, right? Right. So there's no real point to it. Also, a lot of chains, they have a, they're using a DPoS consensus mechanism, right? Distributed uh, proof of stake. Mm -hmm. And it's just several delegators or delegates that decide on the state of the chain. So it's not really different. It's not really that much different from one central party doing it. Again, it doesn't really make a lot of sense that you would support this because it's easy and trivial to shut these things down. If you want a real cryptocurrency, you want it to be nuclear proof. So nobody, no country, no nation state, no government, no company can stop you from using it. And about the Dino, right? you say that is decentralized finance in only in the name. Uh, many investors have experienced huge amount of loss by the Terra and Luna issue. Some say that the ultimate key to the state coin is the collateral. And do you agree with that state coins must have the collateral? Algorithm stable coin cannot be stable with only algorithm? Yeah, so I would break um, the cryptocurrency market into three segments. You have Bitcoin, which is decentralized, permissionless, apolitical. Then you have stable coins, which is the second category. And these are largely centralized. And then you have all the shit coins. Mm -hmm. so, Stable coins in that group, there's sort of two subcategories. One is a stable coin that is backed by the asset. So that would be like uh, USDT, USDC, uh, BUSD, etc., etc. They have a, a reserve backing it, typically dollars. 
Then you have the other subcategory, which is algorithmic stablecoins, like UST, uh, Terra Luna, and DAI, and other ones. But I don't believe that algorithmic stablecoins, as they are, can work. And the reason is they have a shitcoin component to it, right? So in the case of UST or Terra Luna, they have the Luna token that is trying to uphold the peg. But why does the Luna token have value? It's just a token printed out of thin air. Yes. So eventually, this mechanism can be attacked because it has a shitcoin component mm -hmm. to it. Whereas the stable coins that have the asset backing, they can't really be attacked. So there was a, a lot of media coverage about um, Tether, USDT. Yeah. And they were, the media don't really understand how it works. So they were saying USDT lost its peg mm -hmm. and comparing it to UST. But it's very different. The peg for Tether is only broken if Tether doesn't process a redemption. Yes. So if you go and you say, I want to withdraw one billion, mm -hmm. if they don't give you a billion, then they make Tether break. Then the peg is broken. Mm -hmm. But there is a listing on exchanges, typically against US dollars. And the market price can dip below a dollar yes. in some situations because of market demand and supply. But that does not mean the peg is broken. Yes. So what happens is when the price of Tether is driven down to, say, 95 cents, yes. people that understand how it works, they will go and buy as much as they can mm -hmm. And then redeem it for a dollar. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it's then a, makes tether to price higher. Yeah, right. then it goes. Then, then you, it makes peg. Then the peg. Then the the price on the exchanges goes back to ninety nine, yes. nine 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 five mm -hmm. cents. So the peg is never broken. But this is typically poorly understood by a lot of people in the industry and the media as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer your question, I think if you're building a stablecoin, it needs to have some asset backing. Um, the only way you could potentially do a algorithmic stablecoin is potentially with Bitcoin backing, not with a shitcoin token. Mm -hmm. uh, the Terracraft transmission to the various crypto ecosystem like the DeFi and other exchanges, loan mm -hmm. platforms. As a result, we learned that major institutions and VCs in the crypto industry, they are really connected to each other. They make each other's reputation as the throw some more money, and then makes people to believe that project. Uh, what do you think about this situation? They are really connected to each other, and they break together. And what should be done for a more transparent accounting system for mm -hmm. the crypto ecosystem? It's not really transparency in accounting. It's just the nature of VCs that are dabbling in crypto. They're not really VCs anymore. They act more like PE firms or hedge funds in a way, right? They're backing projects early on for rewards, and then they're promoting those projects and dumping on retail. So the VCs are not really venture capitalists anymore, right? They're not even looking for projects that have a, a real product. They're just backing crypto projects with a token and extracting value. So I think it's just the transformation of the entire VC industry. It's no longer really recognizable as traditional venture capital now. They're almost like traders in some way. And I think that's the problem. I think if the government wants to clean things up, you have to look at where the dirty things are happening. And it is largely the VC firms that are making a lot of this possible. Then do you think that crypto market can regain their confidence and rebound beyond the recent years? Because crypto markets are really going down recently, so uh -huh. it is almost half or more than half discount. Yeah. So what could trigger the rebound of the crypto market, you think? Well, I think um, we need to see Bitcoin decouple from the shitcoins. So if you look at the current macro situation for the crypto market, it's largely caused by the blow up of Terra Luna and then by hedge funds that are heavily invested in all these different token ecosystems. So I would say this explosion or implosion of the market is a good thing. It's a massive purge and deleveraging of all of these bad companies and bad projects. Now. 
unfortunately, Bitcoin is dragged down with them yes. when they go down because they usually have Bitcoin on their balance sheet or in their reserves. So they are forced to sell the best asset first uh -huh. and the most liquid asset. So Bitcoin has to come down. But Bitcoin actually has a, a fundamental value to it, right? It is actually a new form of money or a new reserve currency for the world. Mm -hmm. So we see nation states continuing to acquire Bitcoin. El Salvador is buying more Bitcoin. You see companies buying more Bitcoin too, like MicroStrategy. They keep continuing to acquire. They're not buying those kind of projects. Yeah. yeah. So Bitcoin's fundamentals are still very strong. Now, we just have to weather it out. So Bitcoin, we know, will inve inevitably go back up and recover. Mm -hmm. But I think some of those altcoin projects will just be lost forever. They'll never come back. Mm -hmm. So overall, the Bitcoin market will be OK. But some of the crypto projects and crypto market will just be gone. Mm -hmm. Then about coupling, what do you think about the coupling with the Nasdaq and the Bitcoin? Some say it is a kind of good signal because that means that a lot of people are investing in the Bitcoin. So uh, some people who is not the Bitcoin maximalist also invest in the Bitcoin. Right. But it also seems some kind of negative signal because I am also a Bitcoin maximalist too. So really? why <laughs> why Bitcoin is coupling with the NASA? They are they have totally different trade. Right. So I want to know your opinion about mm -hmm. the coupling with the NASDAQ and the Bitcoin. Right. So I would say the reason is there's a lot of Wall Street money in Bitcoin right now. And Wall Street effectively views Bitcoin as a risk on asset. So they are grouping it together with, say, tech stocks. So you can think of um, there's different segments of the market. There's you know traders that trade anything. And then there is uh, institutional Wall Street money. And then there is hodlers. Mm -hmm. Now, hodlers are not going to impact the price that much. Hodlers will largely buy and hold, like MicroStrategy yes. or smaller people in the space might be uh, dollar cost averaging, right? Buying constantly a steady stream of Bitcoin. So you have this slow, steady demand and they're not trading it. So that will not impact the price, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm buying Bitcoin and putting it in cold storage, yes. I'm not going to be moving the price. But the Wall Street firms and the traders are actively trading it trading. and they are moving the price. So for now, at least this time, they are the ones dictating what Bitcoin is because they are the ones that can move the price in concert with things like the stock market. Mm -hmm. So right now, it looks like Bitcoin is a tech stock. It looks like it is a risk on asset. But real Bitcoiners know it is not a risk on asset. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's actually a hedge mm -hmm. and it's a safe haven. So it just takes some time for the market to figure itself out. Mm -hmm. But overall, if you look at Bitcoin's trajectory from inception till now, it's been going up for the past 13 years. And you know, you could say the stocks have devalued massively against Bitcoin or the dollar has devalued massively against Bitcoin. Yes. But there are times, short times, where it does correlate for some time. Then it just tracks up and decouples and then continues going on. Uh -huh. But I would say Bitcoin is designed to absorb all monetary value That's right. on the planet. So it's just a matter of time. We just have to be patient. Oh, okay. In 2019, you said the global regulators will eventually accept the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But for now, however, more than three years later, uh, not, a single, uh, not a single spot, but US still doesn't have a single spot Bitcoin ETF. And other countries are kind of holding their project about the Bitcoin ETF. Uh, do you still think that some government like the US SEC are going to admit that Bitcoin ETF on the spot trading? Well, they should. It, it makes no sense that the SEC is not approving a spot ETF right now. So there are a bunch of futures ETFs, but they're not right. as ideal as a spot ETF. And um, I would say regulators around the world are embracing Bitcoin. So you do have spot ETFs in a number of other countries and regions, just not in the US right now. But um, I think the fear is if the SEC the SEC's fear is if they approve a spot ETF, Bitcoin's price will go to $1 million a coin. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's probably $10 billion of money waiting to pour into a spot ETF, a US spot ETF, when it is approved. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe Gary Gensler wants to be the one that sends Bitcoin to a $1 million a coin. So they're trying to draw it out as long as possible and not approve the spot ETF. But 
it should be inevitable. Someone has to approve it eventually because it makes absolutely no sense, right? They're trying to, um, I guess the request is perfect surveillance of the underlying markets, but you don't even have that for gold markets. So you have to hold Bitcoin to the same standards as you hold other, other asset types, mm -hmm. right? And that's just not the case right now. Is there uh, any country that want to accept the Bitcoin as the currency, except uh, El Salvador? Do you know any kind of countries? Well, the Central African public put forth their own Bitcoin law, but then they went and made a shitcoin. So uh, I'm not really sure what's happening there now. Um, I'm kind of disappointed in the leadership there. But uh, we do have other places that are working towards adopting Bitcoin as uh, legal tender. And certain countries can go about it um, more so as a de facto legal tender. So the city of Lugano in Switzerland has made it de facto legal tender, right? Um, I was just in Panama before I came to Korea, and they were trying to put forth a Bitcoin and crypto law that would clarify the status of these assets. But actually, Panama doesn't need a law because there's no capital gains. Um, you can also do de facto Bitcoin legal tender. It's just if a country puts it into law, then it's a stronger affirmation. But the Panamanian constitution actually says you can use any money you like. They can use the Balboa, they can use the US dollar, yes. and they can also freely use Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a necessity, it's more of a, a nice to have. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, I'm here in Korea too, because I hope yes. Korea will adopt Bitcoin mm -hmm. as right. a, a currency too. What do you think is the key to the mass adoption of the Bitcoin by the nations? And why you think the nations have to accept the Bitcoin as their crypto, uh, not cryptocurrency, their national currency? National currency, right. Right. So I believe it is in the strategic national interest of countries to adopt Bitcoin because Bitcoin can fulfill the role of reserve currency of the world. So right now, the current foreign currency reserve system is dead. So once uh, Russian foreign currency reserves were frozen and seized, it kind of highlighted that you need to be able to have your own money. You can't rely on keeping assets with other central banks around the world. Because one day, your allies might not, no longer be your allies, or your trading partners may no longer be your trading partners. So you need to have money. and the fundamental answer to why you need money is just to survive, right? right? You need to have energy to buy energy. You need to be able to import food, import uh, rare earth minerals for manufacturing, uh, you know, anything you need to sustain a nation state. You will need money to trade and uh, partake in commerce with other counterparties. So it's, in, it's an eventuality that there will be some strife in the world, right? And it is an eventuality that fiat currencies will fail. So fiat currencies cannot last forever because they are printed out of thin air and they are constantly being inflated. The supply is right. constantly being inflated. Okay. So the only way out of this system to break that cycle is to transition into a parallel system, which is Bitcoin, which is disinflationary mm -hmm. and eventually uh, uh, deflationary. Mm. So the sooner we can have more countries adopt a Bitcoin standard and go back to sound money, the better, because the existing system is going to fail. When your entire monetary system is based on the premise or founded on the premise of printing money, you only have two levers, print slower and print faster. Mm. But you must print or else the economy they will die. Print. So the best way is to transition and accept Bitcoin in parallel and have a smooth transition over mm -hmm. to sound money. And that makes Bitcoin's price keep higher. Right? Yes, to likely. Replace the fiat money system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if Bitcoin didn't exist, then I would be saying you should be using gold. Like every country should have mm -hmm. gold reserves because you can store your own gold reserves. Yes. But with the advent of Bitcoin, which is digital gold, it's actually easier to store digital gold and transact digital gold than it is physical gold because you need to hire armed guards, uh, move it on boats, and <laughs> it takes months to move right. it from location to location. So Bitcoin is the future. It's just the world hasn't fully caught up to right. the concept yet. And how about the X2E service, like 
as I said, uh -huh. I think you think that kind of service also does Bitcoin because. So I think you can still use a uh, cryptographic token or a crypto asset. So um, at Blockstream, we launched the Liquid Network, which is a Bitcoin sidechain. And in the Bitcoin sidechain, you can issue assets. So you have Liquid Bitcoin, which is pegged in Bitcoin to the network. You can have stable coins like USDT. But you can also issue other assets too, like game game tokens yes. or game currencies and NFTs. So I have a game project called Infinite Fleet, yes, and we're trying to use the liquid sidechain for the game currency. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, what I don't think is a shitcoin is we're not selling it. You're earning it by playing the game, just mm -hmm. like you'll earn World of Warcraft gold or Adina in Lineage mm -hmm. Two. So. If you're not misleading people and you're not saying this is decentralized, this is the future, it's okay to use that technology to benefit the user base. So the benefit to the user base in that case is they can receive the game currency in a, their non-custodial wallet and their funds can't be you know, frozen by the game operator, which is us. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to empower the players. And because um, you, you basically you fly spaceships in the game, the spaceships are NFTs on Liquid Chain as well, and then the uh, game currency is a token in Liquid. So players can do atomic swaps, which is a trustless exchange. So I can trade with you, um, and there's no way that I can get scammed. Mm, so yes. the trade actually either executes all at once or not at all. So there is a benefit to players by using this technology, and we don't try to tell people this is decentralized and you own it forever. Mm. It's a it's a tool as part of the game. And in fact, we don't even use the P2E or play to earn marketing term. Yes, we don't use X2E yes. because I believe that terminology is just a fancier way to say farming. Mm -hmm. Farming has existed in the game industry and in MMO games for uh, 20 years, right? Yes. It's not a new concept. It's right. just new packaging saying farming is now P2E, but mm -hmm. it's still farming at the end of the day, right? That makes people to make it to the money more easily? Well, you pitch to VCs and VCs will say, uh, wow, it's a new model, mm -hmm. but it's not a new model. Uh, so it's important, I think, to be ethical in all your dealings and not mislead people. Mm -hmm. So you are not sure about that kind of services, sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chinese government are strong regulations about the Chinese exchanges and crypto companies. So all of their companies were gone today, mm -hmm. right? Uh, however, cryptocurrency and blockchains are, we think they are different. Cryptocurrency services and the blockchain services. Um, do you think Chinese authorities will continue their strong anti-crypto and anti-blockchain policies in the future? Um, <clears throat> I think so, because they already have um, enforced those policies and typically they don't go backwards and take a step back and open things up. The other important thing is that China has capital controls and basically cryptocurrencies, stable coins, everything is a uh, it makes capital controls obsolete. So they have to crack down on those things or they have to abolish capital controls. You can't have partial capital controls, yes. right? And that's why China cracked down on mining as well, because mining is just buying Bitcoin with electricity. Right. So if you want capital controls, you have to say you cannot have Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and other things like that. The challenge is enforceability. How much can you enforce your regulations on information? If you can remember 12 words in your mind, mm -hmm and store a billion dollars, yes. what use is capital controls? Because Bitcoin has turned information into money and money into information. They are one and the same now. So what do you do? You have to open up and accept there's a new reality right. and the world has changed, right? And I think it's important for um, the Korean government and the Korean regulators to start thinking about this too. Yes, they are. Because Korea also has capital controls. Yes. But Korea is a developed nation. There's no reason for capital controls now, unless you want to micromanage the entire economy. But the bigger question is, can you enforce those controls? They are no longer effective. Yes, right. So you can't have partial capital controls. Mm -hmm. Either you get rid of it, 
or you go in the path of China and follow China. But I think it's better that Korea follows the path of the U.S., which is being open to commerce and passing favorable, um, less heavy-handed regulation and encouraging business and commerce. And this might be our last question. Sure. Uh, is there anything you want to say about the Korean blockchain industry and the investors about the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency? Hmm. I think um, the Korean industry needs to focus more on Bitcoin mm. and less on shitcoins. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, projects that originate here and it, 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 it's not really one project that can, can um, have a large impact on its own. It's an entire ecosystem. So it is exchanges, it is venture capital, and even the media. And if you encourage this kind of industry, what you're going to get is more Terra Lunas mm -hmm. because they want to make a lot of money, make a name for themselves, and basically milk the retail market. Yes. It's better if you can shift the messaging and focus in Korea to be more about Bitcoin. and increasing adoption of Bitcoin mm. and have companies that just focus on selling Bitcoin. Just that's it. Like the Gen 3. Maybe. <laughs> and, uh, can you tell me what kind of person is the Naive Kere, the president of the El Salvador? And is there any change between after the adoption of the Bitcoin in the El Salvador person's life? Mm -hmm. So I would say President Bukele is a visionary and he's a very hardcore Bitcoiner. So he was involved in Bitcoin well before the Bitcoin law and before Bitcoin Beach. And he had been into Bitcoin a long time ago. So he's trying to use Bitcoin to help his country and help his mm. people. Um, I think the biggest impact that uh, Bitcoin can have on El Salvador and many Latin American countries is that they can modernize themselves and reinvent themselves. and potentially break out of the debt cycle imposed on them by, by organizations like the IMF. So the IMF lends countries in Latin America money, and then they charge interest. So they're stuck in this debt cycle because they need to keep borrowing money to service their debt. And there's really no way out of that. The only way out of that is to create a prosperous nation and potentially with Bitcoin. Because with Bitcoin, they can actually accrue value, right? If you're borrowing dollars from the IMF and the U.S. is printing dollars, then you're, you're getting less and less money, actually, right. right? But you still need to service that debt. Uh, but Bitcoin is a way for them to get out of that. And Bitcoin has done wonders for El Salvador. So we've seen um, tourism has increased 30% from last year, and their GDP is in the double digits. Mm -hmm. And this is directly because of the Bitcoin law. Um, we see Bitcoiners around the world going to El Salvador to see the country and it's on, you know, it's in the, the public consciousness. Everyone's right. talking about El Salvador. Mm -hmm. The New York Times is talking about El Salvador, mm -hmm. even though they're criticizing El Salvador, right. but it's still in the public consciousness and everyone's watching them very carefully. So I would say Bitcoin has been good for El Salvador. Now, in terms of the ordinary citizens of El Salvador, I don't think that there is any market change in their lives. I see a lot more adoption of Chivo and the usage of Bitcoin and acceptance of Bitcoin, but I wouldn't say their lives have changed remarkably in the last year. And it's important that we know it's only been a year, a year plus since the, they've been adopting Bitcoin. So these things will take time. And I believe President Bukele's goal is to focus on the long term. Um, he wants to improve El Salvador for the next 10, 20, 30 years and so on. It's not about making things better next year. And if you look at um, the install base of Chivo, the national wallet in El Salvador, they have uh, almost one third of the country installed. So El Salvador is a country of about six million and they have two point some odd million installs. Mm -hmm. So it's a third of the country that That's is amazing. prepared for the future. And we just have to continue on with education and making people understand why they should use Bitcoin and transact Bitcoin and accept Bitcoin. But the key here is this is a long-term fight and we're just in the very first stage of it. Mm, right. huh. And I'm going to ask you, uh, do you have uh, any plans to meet President Yoon when you are visiting in Korea? 
Um, I would love to meet with him and talk to him about Bitcoin and why Korea should adopt Bitcoin. Um, but I think it's a difficult time right now because of the shitcoins, because of right. Terra Luna and Do Kwan, right? So the, the challenge with uh, pushing Bitcoin adoption is many people, many governments, they conflate the two things. They think Bitcoin is the same as crypto. And a lot of companies actually try to confuse the two things together, right? Like um, a lot of exchanges like Coinbase in the US, they love to say, Brian Armstrong loves to say, Bitcoin and crypto is the same thing. But Bitcoin and crypto are not the same thing. It's completely different. Bitcoin has nothing to do with the crypto industry, right? Bitcoin is in a league on, of its own. And I think those other projects, when they blow up, and they usually blow up spectacularly, they drag us down. So it's more difficult to request meetings now because Bitcoin is confused with the crypto market. But honestly, I, it's like we have nothing to do with those guys. They are always going to shitcoin and we are just going to focus on Bitcoin. But I think we have to keep educating everyone in the world that Bitcoin is here, shitcoins are over here. They will keep blowing up forever and there will be more and more scams and more and more doquans forever. But Bitcoin will continue on its own path. And then we just have to get that message out. But I would love to meet with President Yoon to talk about strategic reasons why Korea should adopt Bitcoin. And there's a number of ways to adopt Bitcoin. You could have um, mining of Bitcoin, you could have Bitcoin in the central bank treasury, or you could encourage um, Bitcoin to be used as a currency. So one of the Federal Reserve Banks, I think of if in Cleveland in the US, they just released a white paper today saying the Lightning Network makes Bitcoin money. So I think it's important to be forward thinking, focus on Bitcoin and how Bitcoin will change the entire monetary system of the future. And I believe Korea should be on the leading edge of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.